thinking is that when we face a constraint, it kicks our mind into this this gear where it's going to find a solution given what's in front of it. And to some extent, limiting those options is really, really helpful. Yeah, so stress is tricky. So there's this really strong belief that we have that what we should do when we feel stress is, for example, find a comfort food, you know, play to the most familiar, you know, easy things for us to understand, wrap ourselves up in a blanket. Um, there is, and there is something that is very psychologically helpful about having structures, right, that, that allows us in some sense to navigate a day, to continue forward, to feel some sense of self-efficacy. So to, to some extent that's true. But mm -hmm. we also now have a situation where it's not just that um, we're under stress, we're also faced with a, a lack of the same tools that we would have used to use to monitor our day. So in the past, you sort of knew, okay, if I've made it to work by X time and I've done this project by noon, I feel pretty good about myself. I've done okay. Right. Now we don't know what makes a good day anymore. First thing that I would recommend is that to the extent that unnecessary uncertainty can be managed, that needs to be managed. And that can be very simple things. That can be as simple as, you know, we're not gonna, we, we used to have this meeting sometime on Friday afternoon, now we're always gonna have it at two o'clock. Um, it, it can be, okay, we don't know exactly what's gonna happen in three months, but we're gonna tell you in plenty of lead time to make the changes you need to, ch you need to make. So anything that can be certain, that does provide a structure, do that first. Um, because then the other pieces, you have a little more flexibility. people's external monitoring devices are now not really present for them either. And so holding them to the same monitoring devices or, or standards or goals as you did before may be really disorienting. It, it just simply doesn't make sense in this context. Um, I know that there have, been, there have been people who talk about, for example, now they're using their in-home exercise equipment. So for example, the Peloton. Yeah. And one of the great things that they do in this equipment is these people say, you showed up, you're already winning. <laughs> you're already getting credit just because you're here. And so what they do is they turn what we would usually think of as a very scale sensitive level of achievement, like you can be a one or a five or a 10, to a dichotomous sense of achievement. That is you did something and you get points for that. Beyond that, we'll take as much as we can get, of course, but you know, giving people again a very clear, this is what you need to do so they can do that will help motivate them to push toward the higher level of achievement within any given, within any given task. On one hand, we, we have habits we like and it's disturbing to have them broken. So for example, my Starbucks habit got broken, I didn't really like it. And when a <laughs> habit is taken away from us, we experience this sense of deprivation that can be really disturbing. Um, yeah. I worked with a company once who had gotten people to use their product for a certain amount of time, 30 days straight, and then they took it away from them. And people said, oh my gosh, I feel disgusting. I feel like I can't even leave the house, right? Yeah. So being forcibly deprived of our habits is pretty painful. But what also happens when you experience a lot of change is that all the cues that told you you should keep engaging in those habits go away too. So your triggers disappear. And that means you don't have, there's nothing that instinctively drives you to engage in those behaviors. So for example, I'm not walking to the office every day, so I don't have the Starbucks trigger, that lowers the pain of letting go of that habit. And so to the extent that our environment now tells us something is really new, our brains don't try to keep executing the same old patterns, and it's called a newness cue. And we basically are living in one enormous newness cue right now. It's a time when people's cognitive structures may be a little bit more flexible. And when some of the, the facts that reinforced a condition staying the same are gone. And so things that may always have been true, we now have a laboratory in which we see if they are in fact always true, or whether they were just artifacts of the circumstances under which we were operating before. When you take away so many things, is that fact still there? And that's a really interesting opportunity to revisit assumptions. Part of the question will be how intentionally we, we decide to learn from this. 
I think that there are going to be cases where people say, okay, thank God we're getting back to normal. Let's leave all that behind. That was, that was a dark time. We want nothing to do with it. But I think the larger proportion of people are going to see this as a time when a new way of thinking was possible. Now, what we would hope um, and this is this is tricky. We've spent a lot of lot of time and effort and research working on ways to shape individual behavior. And so, for example, to get individuals to think about the long term outcomes, and and plan ahead for the future, and save for retirement. And that's all wonderful, wonderful research. But what we don't seem to have done as effectively is train organizations to do this, right? Because we had a crisis in 2008. We got a crisis again now. And somehow we haven't necessarily internalized the importance of long-term planning, um, the importance of building flexibility into our systems. And if there's anything we can get out of this, I would hope that we find a way to institutionalize those mindsets. It's what these industries are likely to do is to retain that flexibility mindset. Um, First of all, they've got to realize now that demand for their product is more fragile than they thought. It doesn't take that much to disrupt it. And second of all, hopefully they realize now that they can do a lot more with what they have than they're doing. If that flexibility can be integrated into future planning, I think you will see a lot more dynamism. Now, how the consumer is going to respond to that is another question. You know, do we really want, you know, um, the same company that's making our post-it notes also making our, you know, our antiseptic wipes. Right. Uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to see how that works out from a branding perspective. We're talking about this as a very cognitive process, and that's certainly right. the case. That we know cognitive structures get disrupted, they allow more creativity, they become problem focused, all those great things happen. Um, we also have to take into account, though, that we can't expect this evenly across the population. For people who have lost friends or family members who are ill themselves, emotion is an, is an incredibly power force, a powerful force in shaping cognition, right? And things like sadness and grief take a very long time to dissipate, and they can prompt people, you know, they're, they're, they're the kinds of emotions that are going to reduce action tendency. And so as the, as the severity of this continues to grow, as we see we all experience more personal losses, we're going to have to... to you know, be careful about our expectations that everybody can go out and create new inventions. Um, the emotional stress that's put on a lot of people can certainly have counteracting forces on our ability to do that cognitively. <laughs>